Did you know the God of Genesis, God of the Bible, is a God who loves new beginnings? He does. So let's take a deep breath. Let go of yesterday, my inadequacies, my, my weakness, my shame. Embrace this day as God's gift. Lift up your heart. And let's learn together to find God in each moment. I want to do that today by considering... Uh, a great spiritual challenge, and it's in the book of Genesis. My friend Jamie Mayado talked recently about an old observation. When you think about what precedes a great vision, often it is an experience of holy discontent. So Moses sees an Israelite oppressed by an Egyptian, or Martin Luther King Jr. sees decades of racial injustice, or Gary Haugen goes to Rwanda and there's this genocide going on, and out of that comes a vision for international justice mission or so on. I want to kind of flip that around and ask, what is it that precedes a bad decision? What's going on before somebody ends up going down the wrong road, choosing the wrong path, not becoming the kind of person or friend or family member that they always knew that they wanted to be? And I believe it's great spiritual force is at the core of what Genesis has written about. I'll, I'll name it by talking about an observation from a great mentor and friend, Max Dupree. He was asked one time about what's a leader's greatest challenge. And one of them that he noted was a leader's job, leader's task is to intercept entropy. Entropy, some of you will know way more than I do, comes out of physics, second law of thermodynamics, roughly the fact that everything's moving from a state of higher to a state of lower organization, the universe kind of winding down, it's kind of losing energy. Uh, it's kind of the opposite of life. And so, and that, that tends to take root in individuals and in organizations. And so Matt said, if you, Max said, if you're going to be a good leader, you're always on the lookout for that. And he wrote down what some of the signs of it are when people have no time for celebrating or for ritual or when folks view other people as an interruption on my time rather than an opportunity to serve. Nancy and I were at a restaurant not long ago. We had to wait a long time for a bill. I asked one of the wait staff, could it be brought to our table? And he just looked and said, I'll tell your server. By which he was letting us know, it's not my job. You're not my table. And actually you should have known that. You are making me feel bad. I'm already overworked bad enough as it is. As opposed to what he could have said, of course I'll do that. I hope you have a great experience here. I own the whole place. When entropy takes over in an organization, people start to look like uh, interruptions of time. A loss of confidence and judgment. People forget to say thank you. Max says, uh, manuals are a sign of entropy in organizations. And... Um, uh, this problem of entropy is actually a great challenge that goes way back in Genesis. John Walton, I mentioned, is one of the great writers about the creation narratives. And he says there are actually uh, three dynamics that are at place in Genesis. One of them is non-order. Um, and that's in the second verse of the first chapter. Tohu wa bohu, the earth was formless and void. Um, things are just chaotic. And then there's creation. That's the bringing of order. Now, order in Genesis is not making things neat and tidy. Um, it is bringing purpose and meaning and functionality and life and goodness and value. So it's a very dynamic thing. And then the other force that will be at work, and we'll see now in Genesis 3, is disorder. Disorder is when you're actually disrupting the order that is present someplace. And here's what's key. Because chaos and disorder are present in our world, if you are not bringing order, then because we don't live in a neutral place, we live at the mercy of entropy and chaos. If I'm not bringing order into life, then entropy and chaos will always win. Uh, 
uh, if you take a car and leave it in the field for 30 years and come back to it, it's not going to be in good shape. Uh, try not brushing your teeth for a couple of days and you will find out entropy is winning in your mouth and people are not going to want to be around you. The great Christian writer G.K. Chesterton talked about how if you want a fence post to remain white, you have to keep painting it. If you don't keep painting it, it will change. If you want it to remain white, you will have to change it. You have to keep painting it. Now, uh, these forces, entropy, order, creation, uh, non-order, and disorder, uh, are at work in our circumstances, in the universe, in the sky, climate, all that sort of thing, but also internally, in my mind. And God wants to bring peace, that is order to me. The opposite of that is despair, disorder. God wants to bring coherence, clarity to my mind. The opposite of that is confusion, disordered thoughts. So uh, you have a garden and that's your mind. Uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the great researcher on flow, writes that the normal state of the mind, the normal state of human consciousness is entropy a condition that is neither useful nor enjoyable. It's a mind that is filled with anxiety and unsatisfied desire. Anton Chekhov, the Russian writer, said, uh, entropy is easy. Entropy alone is easy. So don't expect easy. Now, what happens with Adam in the garden is he's told by God that his job is to work in the garden and protect it, to care for it. And that means he is to intercept entropy. He is to keep out of the garden. You see behind me some vineyards. I'm going to read a few words from the book of Proverbs in just a moment. Uh, Adam's job is to prize and love the vineyard, the garden so much that he intercepts entropy, he keeps out of it anything, especially the serpent, the tempter, that could bring damage to it. And for some reason, he just stops doing that. He does not prize it. You have a life, you have a mind, you have a garden. And the great danger is before we choose to do anything that's bad or that looks terribly evil or wrong is we just drift into a state of entropy where it no longer seems worth the effort because if I am not working on the side of bringing order, learning with my mind, serving with my body, using my time and my energies, if I'm not doing that, then chaos is going to come and take over. It's just that way. We do not live in a neutral existence. Chaos is easy. Uh, and so uh, Adam is not protecting the garden. He doesn't keep the serpent out. And what precedes the disobedience of God, the eating of the fruit, we'll look at that more as we go along. But what precedes it, see, is a failure to intercept entropy. The writer of Proverbs writes about this in the 24th chapter, verse 30. I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who had no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds. The stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. There was a vineyard where everything was falling apart. It wasn't a drought, it wasn't locusts, it wasn't a fire. It was just somebody who didn't care. It was just somebody who did not bring consistent energy See, the opposite of entropy in Scripture is spirit. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the spirit is hovering over the waters. The spirit now is going to bring order to chaos. Spirit is personal power. Uh, I found quite recently I was with somebody and they asked me to do something for them and I just didn't want to do it. And uh, it struck me afterwards when I was reflecting on that I can give myself credit for being a deeply loving person because theoretically I'm willing to sacrifice so much for somebody I love. But when it comes to just actual life day in, day out, the force of entropy, just I don't feel like doing that, even though I know it would be a good thing and an act of love and develop a relationship. The force of entropy is really strong inside of me. And honestly, gang, part of why I'm so grateful for you is somehow when I talk about this together with you, it reminds me it's worth it. Life is worth it. Your life is worth it. Your vineyard is worth it. And mine too. 
So I want to ask you today to do a little entropy assessment. Pause right now. If you want to, you can close your eyes unless you're driving. And take a moment to think about some of the vineyards in your life. Is there anywhere where entropy has been getting a hold of you? Maybe in your work life, you've been kind of mailing it in for a while for whatever reason, you're resentful of somebody there, discouraged or feel like a failure. Whether or not you get a paycheck, are you working with your whole heart? Or maybe it's your body. God has given that to you as his gift to you. That's your little kingdom. That's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you taking care of it well? Are you feeding it well? Are you letting it have some rest? Are you exercising it? There'll be people that need your body, you know. Or maybe your finances. It can be so easy to just get slack, let it go, give in to greed, not pay much attention to it, not be generous with it, not be well organized with it. Any entropy in your financial life? Or how about your relationships? Just think for a moment. If you're a young person, maybe your relationship with your parents or maybe with a roommate or a friendship, friendships which can be so vital if they're cultivated. If you serve your friend and ask them questions and are curious about them and know how to love them well, or if you just go into default mode, just drift mode in a relationship. or your character, any habits that are going on that are just moving in the wrong direction, any snake in the garden, any weeds coming in your relationship with God. And then today, don't be overwhelmed by that. Entropy can be very, very overwhelming. So, so don't try to do too much. Just take one step, pull one weed, go to the vineyard and pull one weed. If you got a big stack of emails and they feel paralyzing you, so you are in email entropy, just answer, you know, whatever amount of time that you want to spend where you know you can do this. Five minutes doing emails, do that one. Oh, with God. Pray one prayer to God. Talk with God about one part of your life that's hard for you right now. Or if it's a relationship with another person, send somebody a text, just one. Make a phone call to somebody, just one. Or if it's in the financial area, make one gift or pay off one bill or take a look at your bank. Whatever it is, you can, with God's help, bring order, creation, good, and intercept entropy today. End of teaching, beginning of your day with God. Thanks for joining us. My name is Tim. I'm a part of the team here at Become New. If you'd like to receive the emails that go along with each video, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe. Or if you'd like to receive a text alert whenever we release a new video, you can text the word become to the number 855-888-0444. If you have a prayer request, please let us know. You can text that request to that same number, 855-888-0444. There's a group of us who meet every day to pray over those requests. So we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.